We've all heard of the famous fire in the belly. But have you ever wondered what ignites that spark and what keeps the fire burning through rain and storm? Well, I have. And when I have a question, I like to ask it. I'm Deepika Mahidhara. Welcome to TikTok, where I talk to people about what makes them tick. Good morning, Roshan, and thank you for agreeing to come on to TikTok and talk to me about what makes you tick. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, um, the topic itself was so intriguing that I was quite interested in saying that I've actually never sat back and analyzed what makes me tick. So, so this would be a great session of introspection and getting some perspective as well. So, thank you for calling me. Uh, Roshan, you've had about seven careers. And I haven't counted Speechless being the author of Speechless <laughs> as one of them. So yeah. that's eight. Right. And you have, uh, you've begun this really vibrant community uh, for storytelling. So that's more than seven, I'd say. I think so. I think we're at about nine and a half now. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Roshan, how do you do this? Uh, you know, I, I think I, I keep saying that the one important thing is that I'm a very curious person. And I think being a curious learner is something that will accompany me throughout my life. If there's anything that I find which is unique, which is new, I always look at that as an opportunity to learn. Um, and the second part is that while I'm a curious learner, I'm also a, a very focused implementer. I hate having conversations that don't lead to things. So for me, anything that I have done, I think the reason why I've done so many things is I, I got onto my debating team in school because I was curious about why can't a class 9 student be in a debating team. So if you're curious and if you actually go out there and keep questioning the status quo, it leads to I think a lot of doors opening for you. Then it's up to you to start implementing. So I think, I think part of it is the curious learning, the rapid implementation and also the fact that I'm not scared of failure. If I fail in something, I will happily move on. I have done a couple of things which don't show up on my resume. I, I set up a company that was thinking about doing film design, mm -hmm. right, you know, so, so media design for films. And when I started doing that in about two months, I realized that it's not, you know, it's very dependent on the whims and fancies of stars, uh, production houses. And I said, no, you know, it's actually, it's not direct creativity. It seems to be creativity bases a brief again. And I'd done enough of that earlier. So I stopped that. So, you know, so, so I, I, I say, I keep saying that in today's world, fail fast, do fast, fail fast, start something again. So that's how I do it. Nice. So Roshan, um, you're a storyteller and that is how everything began for you, right? Yeah. Your passion for stories. Tell us the story of your journey, please, for my viewers. So I was four years old and uh, I was taking part in my first play, uh, studying at a uh, you know, municipal nursery in Lucknow. So when I came on stage, the other two actors had frozen because they were four years old, right? Okay. And they had frozen and they were just standing like this, petrified. And I got on stage and I remembered everyone's lines. So I sort of held the play together. Huh. And when I did that, um, the, the teacher came at the end of the day and said, you know, this is izzat bachali and stuff. So that's how my journey began. But I think the joy of being on stage from there was something that was an addiction. So I loved being on stage. I was in every play. I would jump on stage, I would jump on I was in Lucknow, my parents were teachers. Uh, they gave me the freedom to do what I wanted. The only thing they told me was saying, being teachers, we have limited budgets. Mm -hmm. So don't try and expect that we'll be able to support you through your life. And I think this was a great galvanizer because what it did to me was it said, okay, I have a, I'm on a time limit. When I come out of college, I must be able to do something on my own. So I used college again as an opportunity not to sit back and just chill, but to do things. So I was in the debating team. I joined dramatics. I joined a professional theater group with Amaraza Hussain in Delhi called Stage Door, started traveling the country at a very early age. So I think my love for the stage was a, was a very inherent thing. The second part, of course, was the love for telling stories. So because I was a good storyteller and I loved the stage, I had very few inhibitions. Um, I also set up a street theater group when I was in college. So street theater, if you have any other inhibition left, street theater will break it. Because when you're on the street, you are contending with traffic, people's attention, a cow that's crossing the road, a policeman who's running behind you with a danda. So you've got to handle all those situations. So I did all of that. So I think A, being able to easily adapt to situations was something. So these were all the tools. Mm -hmm. I put them into use when I came out of mass communication and I went on to radio. 
Um, I got onto radio because again, I heard somebody talking down to people and I said, okay, this guy knows about jazz, but why is he talking poorly to his audience? Why is he, you know, um, talking down to them? And I found a way to get into All India Radio. I got inside, I met the station director and he said, listen, you're right in what you're saying, but what are you going to do about it? So I said, I can host a show for you. And he challenged me and said, in two days? I said, yes. And I went, I found a small tape recorder, I recorded interviews, I figured out what the top 10 songs were. I created a show called Dasse Gyara. Um, I hosted that for a few weeks and then Times FM picked me up. And Times FM, you know, FM was at that stage which was just starting. It was the first private frequency. Mm -hmm. So with a single private frequency, the communication, we were the voice of people. So we didn't realize our own power till about six months later they took us on a road show. And believe you me, any place we used to stop, there would be a crowd of a few thousands. And I said, oh my God, this is the power of radio. And the minute as a media person you have built an audience and connected, it automatically translated into television. So I started doing television, started doing public demand. It was again a road show. So all my theatre experience came into use, my street theatre experience came into use, my communication with people on radio came into use. And possibly I could have remained only a talent and continued doing that. I think the first big step that I took was setting up Encompass. Um, many people were like, why don't you just buy big cars and relax? And I was like, I don't know. I think having a professional company behind an MC, because mm -hmm. I was emceeing shows, but I was emceeing disasters. You know, the event manager would have promised something, delivered something else, not done enough. And I was like, why do they do that? So it was again a niggling, you know, something was niggling at the back of my mind. I was just getting very angry about it. And again, as I said, if it's a problem that faces you, go and solve it. So I got a bunch of my friends who were from as varied backgrounds as somebody was at Masscom, still a student. Somebody we met at a pawn shop who was a lawyer's son doing nothing. You know, I cobbled together a team of people. And I think I'm good at leading teams. So I immediately quickly set a process, got everyone together and that's how Encompass began. So Encompass happened, continued for the longest time, grew into being one of India's largest event agencies. And again, lots of people would have this opinion of saying, you know, event companies are set up by people to run lifestyle businesses. Right? Now what's a lifestyle business? Improve your own lifestyle. That business. Okay, <laughs> I never took out a rupee from Encompass. Everything would go back into Encompass. In building a bigger office, in hiring more professionals. I, I do want my viewers to hear the journey okay. from okay. you. So, Encompass, Geometry Encompass and what happened after? So, uh, you know, when I, when I did uh, Encompass, uh, when Geometry Encompass happened, it, did, it wasn't Geometry Encompass initially, it was just Encompass with JWT. And a year into that journey, I was with uh, SRK hosting some shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a conversation where before a show, we had some time and he was like, what are you doing? I said, film is not made. And he was very interested because he said, Red Chilies wants to get into making films that don't have Shah Rukh in them. And so I began a two-year journey of making a film, took a break, sabbatical from Encompass, learnt the world of Bollywood, how the road to hell is paved with good intentions, uh, made 87 drafts of a script, uh, heard 3,000 different songs. But, you know, at the end of it, when I came out of that process, I had a film. It was a very small film. When I came back in 2011 to Encompass, I was now in the need for something fresh to do. Mm -hmm. So two boys had helped me with the title sequence of my film. And they were just great with digital work. So when I started talking to them, I said, so what is this digital? And they were explaining to me the kind of things they do, social media, etc., etc. And I said, hey, this is really, really interesting. And they said, listen, we're just a startup. We don't know how to run a company. Can you help us? So I didn't have money to pay them for the film title sequence. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you one year, I'll give free food, I'll give free food, I'll give you a drink, I'll give you a drink, I'll give you a drink. So they used to keep coming to me for advice. And in that advice, over a period of time, I think six months into it, they said, listen, our time with you is running out. We'd be very happy if you actually became a part of the company. And I was like, I would love to. So I invested in Glitch. And from 2011 to 2018, Glitch went on to be amongst India's top 10 digital agencies. And many people come to me and say, you know, where did you spot the opportunity? I said, I don't spot the opportunity, I spot the talent. I find the right people and I invest in people. So that happened. Um, in between, Commune happened. Commune happened more as just a, it started as more of a support system of friends who came at the end of the film to say, listen, it's fine if a film didn't do well, it's all right, spend time together. But in all the creative conversations, I felt that most of us were looking for a second innings. You know, I mean, 20 years of a career in media I had done. But what could I do now that was different? And so we started saying, we are all from the performing art. And so we came up with a bunch of ideas. The cheapest idea we came up with was storytellers. So I said, storytellers, we need a camera. We need to talk about it. 
I said, this is really down and dirty, let's do this. And in that moment, I discovered that this vulnerable first person storytelling was a powerful art form because there's so much synthetic stuff that is available on social media. See, we are all filtering what we put. That's all life with a lens put on it and life with a layer that of unreality. Storytelling offers a very, very vulnerable side of people coming out openly. So that's what happened. And uh, Commune has now grown to about two and a half lakh people on YouTube, about 1 lakh 17,000 people on Facebook. We are building Commune in other cities. So to do that, it's just such a, it's such a, I got up feeling so happy saying, see, you go out and you work hard and you do it selflessly and it'll happen. When you have a problem, when you meet, let's say, failure or, you know, you, you could be in a dilemma. So many things happen in life, right, yeah. personally and professionally. And for somebody like you, where all the things that you do professionally are actually your passion. So I'm sure it's all very personal at the end of the day. What is it that keeps your fire going at such times? So, so you know, in the last couple of years, I must be honest and tell you that there were one or two months where I actually felt depressed and low and, you know, and, and because nobody is, you, I, I'm normally such a force of action that when I become like that, people notice around me. Like, they, like everybody would turn and say, are you fine? Are you fine? Are you all right? And even I didn't know what was wrong. I think it was just a period of stasis. And I think even creative people, sometimes boredom is great because in that boredom or in that paralysis that you feel, your, your, your mind is still working, your mind is churning. And that's when you need a couple of people who either are mentors or supporters. I also have a lot of practices for personally recharging myself. I, I was offered to work on Aladdin the musical as an actor. Now, it was not going to be a paying job. But when I was analyzing it, I was like, you know, should I do it? It'll take three and a half months to four months. But I hadn't done theater on stage for 20 years. I directed, I'd done a cameo, but I had not done the discipline of theater. And for four months, I went back. You know, it jolted me, it shook me up. I was reporting for rehearsal at 8 in the morning, staying there till 8 in the evening, sometimes even later, hanging around half the day doing nothing because other people had scenes to do. I was not the star. I was a bit player. Uh, I had to evolve my whole look as Jafar. Now, I don't look like a villain. So, <laughs> I had to play the villain. And I'm so glad that you shared this piece because somebody like you, there are lots of theatre people out there, actors who, when, uh, who struggle with making the decision about what kind of roles to take. So, no, you know, you know, my, my, my theatre director, Amir, had said a line which I never forget and I share with everyone, saying there are no small roles, there are only small actors. So I played Jafar, who's the villain. I had eight scenes, but I made sure that I was noticed. So my, my whole, the fire burning inside was, boss, I'll play such a good villain, I'll be so villainous <laughs> that people will enjoy it. And you know, I changed my look. I, I used to do prosthetics for an R. So I cancelled out my eyebrows. I made false eyebrows arched on top. I did a, I did a goatee. Uh, etc. I put on lenses that were green. But you know, it was just fun. And people used to come to me and say, you were so deliciously villainous. I was great. <laughs> you know? Deliciously yeah. You know, so, so four months of doing that gave me the shake-up that I needed. So I think I crave experiences. So either I create them or I crave them. You know? And that too is a great recharge. So I think creative people need to keep recharging themselves with things they do. Mm -hmm. I also do a lot of online courses. Nice. So I take time out to do two courses every year. So Future Learn is a, is a site which offers you free courses. Mm -hmm. So I did this course on leadership because I was like, okay, I have naturally evolved into a leader, but what is leadership? Let's read about it. Let's do a course. In that course, I, I got a lovely lesson. So they said, you know, most people talk about a work-life balance. But they said, you know, there's nothing called a work-life balance. There are actually different quadrants. Yeah. And the four quadrants in which that course asked me to think was, it says there's family, there is self, there is profession and there's community. Mm -hmm. So it says don't engage with only one at the cost of the others. Mm -hmm. So I actively feel that I engage with all four. So I do a lot of things for personal development and I have a set of friends. I have family. I love spending time with Shaheen. She's the maddest human being I could marry. You know, and she's, a, I mean, we are chalk and cheese. So it's fabulous because we pull things into two totally different directions. My children and I have great conversations. So that's family, right? Work. I'm constantly engaged with, I'm doing new things all the time. It's very, very fulfilling. But commune for me is what I do in my sense as the community bit. So for some people, it might be charity. For some people, it might be going and helping with an old age home or, you know, some people become extremely spiritual as they go along. 
for me, commune fulfills the spiritual part of me. You know, it actually is something which I never look on it as a monetary piece at all. You know, um, but I also feel that filling all these quadrants is critical as a human being. Work-life balance is another thing I wanted to talk to you about, especially for somebody who's doing things that he absolutely loves, right? How do you strike the work-life balance? So, you know, it's very easy. So, I often say this saying that don't work for money and then I give it a caveat saying when you made lots of money, it's very easy to say. Um, there was a time when I worked for money. There was a time when I was going in the morning and doing a radio show, going and shooting for a television thing, going and doing a live event, going back to do a radio show mm -hmm. and then coming home. Mm -hmm. Uh, that actually cost me my first marriage. Honestly, I think that taught me a lot of things. That also taught me that, you know, finding a balance is important. Finding your worth is important. See, very often in the creative field, I think people fail because they don't know where to pitch themselves at. Right? Yeah. So, you're dying to do something and somebody's going to exploit you because they know that you're dying to do it. So, they'll pay you very little. At that moment, learning to say no is critical. You know, I, I have built myself a certain standard of work and compensation for that work. So one thing which I keep saying is that, you know, as creative people, don't get cheated out of your livelihood. There are tons of people who just cheat creative people out of their livelihood. Um, you know, and you've got to find your space and fight for it. Fight for it, build your own audience, do whatever you can, but you can do it. The second thing, as I said, is that at some stage in life, you know, um, and again, I want to give credit to Shaheen for the same because... You know, she makes sure we take time. So I think having a partner who lets you be and at the same time pulls you back or pulls you up and you make mistakes is equally important and, and I'm blessed to have that. Um, the, the other thing with this whole work-life balance is there are times when it will shift in one side or the other. Uh, don't neglect it entirely because I can tell you I have seen that neglect and what it can do. But on the other side, there are times when you've got to just explain to the other person saying, listen, I need a month when I'm just going to do this because it's critical to us. It's critical to the entire family. Yeah. And that's really important. So I think, I think that's where I say I don't have a magic formula. Everybody finds their own level of balance. I genuinely feel that between teaching, uh, between spending time with my family, between coming up with new creative ideas, um, doing some amount of investment. Um, you know, I, I, some, someone says, so who are you today? I said, I'm a bridge to possibilities. And I'm happy with anyone going over that bridge. And I'm happy if somebody walks over me to go to that bridge. What is it that people should do? What, or you can probably share with us what you do when you're scared of doing something new. Are you ever scared? Or if people are, what, what can they tell themselves? Or what can they think about to just overcome that fear? So, um, when I did Aladdin, I was shit scared of dancing because I've got two left feet. There is one thing called analysis paralysis. Okay? When people overanalyze a situation, they paralyze themselves. I don't. I just jump in. So there's a book by Mark Burnett called Jump In. And Mark Burnett is the guy who made the, um, the Survivor television show, Amazing Race, etc. And Mark Burnett just, you know, talks about the fact of saying jump in. Just jump into the deep side of the pool, swimming will come. So that's largely my philosophy when I do things. Speechless actually, you know, as an idea, the book came as an idea to me because I was judging a lot of uh, pitches at uh, uh, startup ventures. Mm. So I would see a lot of people come. Some people who started in the US would come and pitch a bad idea beautifully. Lots of Indians would come with a great idea and just not be able to pitch. So I have again found a gap. And I got really pissed off about it saying, Kyu nahi aata? Kya problem hai? And again, it's this problem of nobody having told them that public speaking can be a joy. Public speaking can get you places. Public speaking is motivational. Public speaking is what you and I are doing, you know, interpersonal space. But hey, we are still speaking in public. And I've had so many experiences of communication, whether it's radio, television, theater, as an MC. I mean, you know, I, I, nowadays anyone's resume, as he says, they've hosted a thousand shows. I've actually hosted more than a thousand shows, maybe a couple of thousand. But, you know, it's not that. It's the experience you pick from it. And I've maintained a black book all the time about I, I made this mistake on stage, I could have done this better, I used this joke, this worked, this didn't work, this is a great opening line, this is not. So again, you know, this teacher part of me, I keep taking notes and putting them down. So I had all these notes and uh, I go to this conference called Stream. Mm -hmm. So Stream is India's only unconference. It's closed to WPP. So being a WPP person, I get to go there. A lot of marketeers are invited, a lot of creative people are invited. And in that, in the first year, I saw everybody's doing discussions. I said, I'm doing discussions, I'm doing workshops. 
And the minute I did the workshop, the workshop got full. And the first year I did a workshop on telling stories because I just started commune. And that went down fabulously. And the next year I did a workshop called Speechless. Mm. So I am I'm again good with pitching things. So I came up with the name saying Speechless. So what leaves you speechless? What makes people speechless? So therefore your fears, yeah. your delivery. Siddharth Banerjee, who's my co-author, is the CMO of Vodafone. And he actually, when he attended the workshop, came to me and said, can I tell you something? So, yeah. He said, yeah, you know, when you did that workshop, you made it sound so easy because you do this for it's your profession. Your income comes from getting on stage and talking, which is why you give it so much credence. He says, for a marketeer, na, it's one of the things we do. So some of the stuff you tell is very difficult for a marketeer to do because they're not focusing that much. I figured some ways in which corporate people do it. So I turned to him and I said, hey, why don't we do this together? And that's how I got my co-author. And if it hadn't been for him, the book would not have been written. Because there are 100 ideas that are starting to So this would have actually faltered if it wasn't for Siddharth calling me and saying, bye And we would constantly keep meeting. But it really did. I mean, I know there are some parts of the book which are about frameworks and the slightly more uh, the logic of things. So we've divided the book into the logic and the magic. In all of your talks, the one thing that really inspired me is you said that even as you were successful in, in all of these fields that you entered, you very quickly made yourself redundant. Please tell us something about that. I mean, why and what does it give you? So, so if you want to do new things, you've got to make your previous role redundant. Otherwise, they will keep calling you back for that, right? So my logic was that, that if I am going to be a radio producer and I don't hire a person to produce radio, every time something needs to be produced, they will call me, which means my time will be limited to do this. So how will I do television? When I started doing television, I set up a production house. I immediately got Sham to take care of that production house or Sukrit to take care of Encompass because I have to move on. You know, when you, when you stand on the shoulder of giants, you can look beyond, right? And that's what I do. So I find a giant or I find somebody who's a human and I build them into a giant. And then I just stand on their shoulders and look beyond. So there's so much more that you can see. And that's what I like to do. And people get people who are stuck to a job or a title are very scared of becoming redundant. But people who are creative, who are always thinking of something new, for them, redundancy is one, is credence in the other. It suddenly gives you the opportunity to do something unique in the next. And that's what I keep doing. And you know, um, I have friends who are still stuck to radio after 25 years, still are radio jockeys, still talk about the fan mail they get, still talk about how they travel to Nepal to win an award somewhere, etc. Very good. If that's your universe and you're happy in it, so be it. I think I want to be in many universes. I want to live in multiple universes. And therefore, in this universe, you find your solar system, you find somebody who's the sun and move on and fly to the next. And that's what I keep doing. Thank you very much. This has made my day. Thank you so very much. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. If you did, could you please like, share and subscribe? Also leave us a comment about what you took away from the conversation. And definitely let us know who inspires you. I'd like to talk to them too.